Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Sego and welcome to Let's Talk Native. I'm John Kane. I am your host, and I've got to talk about something that I've I've mentioned um, on on another show. I have posted something on uh, on Facebook about this, but I've got to address the the, the stimulus package that included thirty one billion dollars heading to quote unquote Indian country, um, and and there's two parts that I'm trying to address here. One is some of the euphoria that I'm hearing about, about this and how great it is and, and how it's a game changer and, you know, and all this stuff, other stuff. And that's, that of course is coming from, you know, some of the, the very pro American native people that, that are, you know, the, the same ones who are, you know, euphoric, euphoric over Deb Hallen's appointment and, and really feel like, Native people are being taken care of by this this current administration. So there's, I, I I want to tamp some of that down, but I also have to address the on the other end of that spectrum are those those who are claiming that that we are getting something that is tantamount to reparations. And in fact, some of what I was hearing out of the Black community was that that we got pushed to the head of the line ahead of decades of uh, you know of calls for reparations and that kind of thing. So on one on one hand I need to I need to really push back about those who are suggesting that that this 31 billion dollars is is something that we are either not deserving of <laughs> or that is that is a is a gift in some sort of form of reparations or something. So I need to address that, but I also need to tamp down some of the euphoria that uh, that is coming from uh, from from native territories. So let me get right into it. First off, thirty one billion dollars is a lot of money. Um, you know, but by, by most standards, it's it's a lot of money. But the fact that it's being touted as this historic level of um, you know of dollars heading into to native territories look there ha there's been such gross underfunding of the federal government's obligation to native territories that this 31 billion dollars doesn't even doesn't even fill the gap i mean i've heard this you know referred to as a drop in a bucket but it's a drop in a leaking bucket there you know the the federal government has taken on certain obligations and, and not out of the goodness of their heart, mind you, the obligations that the federal government has towards native people for health, education, and welfare is born out of the fact that they, they, that our lands were seized or ceded, however you want to, you want to call it, not through war and, and to the victors went the spoils. Most of it was through some sort of fraud, fraud in the form of treaties, that oftentimes were never, you know, uh, you know, fully um, uh, supported by the federal government. Fraud in the in uh, in the form of uh, of leases and 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 any number of things, including just blatant fraud by uh, industry and by government. And and the fraud committed by government, I'm going to get into that later. But first off, I want to uh, want to just address the fact that. Much of the compensation that came to Native peoples because of forced relocation and forced removal, trails of tears, um, land set, you know sessions, much of that con compensation was really, really grossly underfunded. I mean, it, it, it was pennies on the dollar. It, it, it wasn't even close to what would, would have been real valuation. And much of the, that compensation came late, if it ever came at all. In fact, many of the people who were the the immediate victims of removal 
the immediate victims of of having their lands you know taken from them by whatever means would actually never even see the, see the compensation. It would come so late. It would be people who were not necessarily directly affected, indirectly affected, generationally. There's no question about that. And I think about the the, the Cherokee and the and the what people know as the, as the that Trail of Tears. It would take so many years for the Cherokee to be compensated for having their lands seized from them and and being forced to move out to Oklahoma. That it would be an entire generation later. And, and the amount of strife that people would go through. Again, you fast forward uh, to um, what would be considered the, the, the Sioux Wars, if you will, um, that were born out of Abraham Lincoln signing the, uh, the Homestead Act. Much of that, those dollars that were supposed to go towards, uh, towards Native peoples would come so late that in the, in the meantime, there was there were major conflicts between native people and the, and the people who were encroaching through this homestead act onto their territories. That would be not just the basis of these uh, of these conflicts, but it would be the basis of the uh, of the the hanging at the uh, uh, of the Dakota Thirty Eight in Mankato, Minnesota, the day after Christmas in 1862. That w- that was part of that whole conflict was because there, w- there was never pro- adequate payment being made. And not just payments in dollars, payments in food and everything else. Part of the the, the raids on villages and that kind of thing was out of desperation. So the the fraud that was committed, again, even going back over 100 years ago, was was significant. The delay in payments, the inadequate payments, all of that stuff was there. But if we go, even if we fast forward, over the last few, few administrations, there's really been cuts in funding, even do, do, during Obama and Biden, but certainly during uh, during Trump. The, the cuts in uh, funding to Indian Health Services and and uh, and any number of uh, protections that were supposed to be in place for Native people, uh, you know, w- were were wiped out. The the failure of the Interior Department to protect Native territories who got involved in gaming from overly aggressive states. I've talked about that on my show. The dollars that were that were lost. And, and I'm talking about dollars that some of which we, we generated ourselves that we were screwed out of, like, like with revenue sharing. But the dollars that were lost because of funding cuts. And again, I want to be clear. The federal government made promises. And I know that sounds pitiful to even say it that way. But the, they, they made commitments to ensure that our health, education, and welfare would be taken care of. Now... I'm not saying that was, you know, I'm not, I'm not blaming our people, my ancestors for, for accepting those deals. I don't think there was, there was a whole lot of accepting. It just, it, it is what it is, but the failure in the United States to, to, to not provide proper health care, proper housing, you know, uh, uh, adequate opportunity. And in fact, just the opposite, the policies that the United States adopted towards native peoples who retained our lands were, were, <laughs> were so inadequate and, and or intentionally in, inadequate that they created the poverty that exists on most native territories today. And it's intentional. It's not an accident. It's not like, oh, we screwed up. No, we have listened to politicians throughout the years decry even the, the small parcels of land that we managed to hang on to. They condemned their own quote unquote reservation system because they claimed it allowed us to stay uncivilized and to remain, you know, um, to, to, to somehow push back against assimilation. And, and on to that latter point, I'll agree. The fact that we still retain our lands and that, that we can fight for our distinction, our lands are a part of that. But see, they saw that as a problem and they still see it as a problem. The whole quote unquote reservation system had, had two parts to it. One, a place to, to push all the native people to push them out of, uh, out of the way and let them die there and create policy that would make it almost unlivable for native people to live on, uh, live on these native territories, on these reservations. In fact, they would create, you know, other policies like the, the relocation act during the Nixon administration that would encourage native people to leave the territory. They would give them some crappy job in a city and maybe a, a lousy apartment and, and try to cut the ties. And today, as it exists, as, as life exists today, 
There is an exodus of Native people leaving Native territories. Why? Because it is almost impossible to realize any level of hope or dream, you know, for a successful future for Native people on a territory. Not, it's not impossible. But based on the model that we're exposed to, seeing on the Internet, on television and movies and read, uh, read about, everything that we're exposed to from the outside, the lives that we live on our territories— you know, can't, can't, can't compare. And so we're taunted with all of this stuff that's not available to us and this way of life that's not available to us. And it's not available to us because it's, it's because we are being deprived of it. And so it, it creates, you know, again, the, the haves and the have nots, it creates such disparity, uh, not only from a quality of life standpoint, but even basic, you know, economics, basic, uh, you know, income. The disparity is incredible. See, all of this stuff is created. And, and even when something does get established, you know, like the commitment towards healthcare, it gets altered over time. Today, if a Native person wants to get, uh, get their health care from their own on-territory clinic, if you will, the first thing they have to do is they have to, they have to either provide insurance, their own insurance, uh, purchased or through their employer or whatever else, or they have to apply for um, for Medicare. Because in order for, for a clinic to service you, they want to make sure that they're getting paid. And so when you do it through Medicare, it's not from the federal government, it's from the state. It's only what's not covered by insurance, what's not covered by Medicare, that the Indian Health Services steps up to. So it becomes a social service issue. It becomes a welfare issue in many cases based on their perception of our poverty that they caused instead of a fulfillment of a treaty obligation or whatever, a verbal, nonverbal obligation from the federal, federal government to provide health care. So they shift some of that burden to the state. They make us have to have to apply as, as quote unquote welfare recipients to get health care in our, in our own clinics. That's not the deal that was signed up for. That's not what billions of acres of our lands were were, uh, were seeded for. Not so that we could be part of their social service uh, uh, program, their, their their welfare program. Then and then even that it gets cut. There, you know, we we see it year after year, diminished returns on uh, on our health service. So when thirty one billion dollars is now uh, provided in the the COVID stimulus act. Uh, the COVID stimulus bill. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it not even coming close to filling up the gap that was created by a failure to fulfill its obligations. Most of that $31 billion is supposed to be going towards, uh, towards health, uh, health care in, in some means or fashion. I don't know. And, and of course, the other thing that, that I got to say before I even get too far into the, into the breakdown is, we also know that a lot of the, the federal dollars that, that are earmarked for Native territories just gets burnt up in bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that, that we are barely even a part of. You know, so the Bureau of Indian Affairs gets theirs, all of these contractors get theirs, all of these consultants get, uh, get theirs. By the time it comes down to act, the, the actual number of dollars that go to a Native territory that provides some sort of benefit or service to Native people, it's greatly diminished. It is greatly diminished. But when you look at the current status of our healthcare, look, we've we've died at a higher rate than anybody else in the United States for um, as as a result of this uh, this COVID pandemic. Well, why is that? Why are we inherently unhealthier? Well, it's because of the policy that the U.S. has created and the failure of the United States to provide its promise for adequate healthcare. We're not getting the state of the art health care that uh, you know that anybody else is getting. What we're getting is you know is you know the the complete back of the line you know uh, you know um, uh, technology as it relates to trying to help us with our health care. I mean, we don't have a whole lot of dialysis machines on our territory. That all gets farmed out. So all of the dollars that come in immediately leave even for health care because we don't. We're not given the opportunity to, to even provide the adequate health care ourselves. So the lion's share of this 31, uh, 31 billion dollars is, uh, is is tied to uh, to increasing and 
supplementing or, or somehow fixing some of the broken healthcare uh, systems on our territories. And that is the, the fact that it's tied into a COVID uh, stimulus bill package is it, 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 perhaps that was a convenient way for, the, for this administration to, to deal with it. But I have to remind people, Joe Biden was a part of the Obama administration where some of these failures uh, occurred as well, including the Interior Department failures that I talked about earlier. So, and, and it gets worse. So, uh, but I'll, like I said, I'll get to that after I get through some of this. Now, there are other parts of this has to do with education and infrastructure, all of which, are, again, we are completely bypassed. We don't have internet on na native territories. For the most part, we have the worst internet or access to the internet that out of anybody in the United States. There have been fiber optic cables that were, have been run around native territories. I have to do my shows here and my access to the internet in my studio here on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation is based on using a uh, a a Wi-Fi or MiFi jetpack from Verizon. So I got to pay, you know, a $500 uh, cellular bill just so I can not only have my phones, but so I can have, have internet here on, on territory, you know, be, because we, we simply don't have any fiber optic cable run through here. Now, some of the, um, uh, the stimulus dollars are supposed to go towards upgrading and updating and providing, you know, at least the nominal infrastructure that off territory has. So, that's where a lot of this is, this stuff is. It, it is it it is about trying to, um, I guess, backfill some of the um, the underfunding that that has taken place. But I got to tell you, it doesn't even come close. It doesn't come close to 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 filling the gap. Look, I'm glad it's coming. I'm glad you know native territories are going to see their 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 clinics improved and and see their education systems improved. Yeah, you know, again, we have the highest, you know, dropout rate. We, you know, our, our education system, there, by some estimates in, in many schools, and, and I was just talking to some folks, and I'll talk about that later too, from, uh, um, from Pine Ridge. One of the big efforts that, uh, that was initiated out there uh, with their uh, bears on, on Pine Ridge uh, was based on the fact that gradu kids who are graduating from high school that, that, set, that only could read at a third grade level. Well, how the hell does that happen? Well, that's a failure of education system. And it's not our failure. It's the, because that is, education system is provided from the outside for the most part. So, so that's what this $31 billion is supposed to um, uh, do. It's supposed to try to backfill some of uh, the, the inadequate funding that, uh, of the past. It doesn't do it. It doesn't come close. I'm glad it's coming. But here's, this is where, where I've got to go. And this is the part that kind of really pisses me off. I have heard, especially from, from some folks in, in the black community, that this $31 billion represents reparations that Native people are getting almost as if we were pushed to the front of the line ahead of black people. And of course, it's simply not true. This isn't reparations. And this isn't about being pushed uh, in, uh, to the head of the line in front of, uh, in, in front of black people. So let me just say that. Now, there, look, there's a lot of um, uh, um, inequalities in the United States. Racism, you know, is it got put on, you know, on, on for, you know, clear display during the Trump administration, but it's always been there. It has been there for, for, for a long time. So when I hear, you know, another marginalized people condemning us as if we got pushed to the front, of, uh, 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 to the front line ahead of them, look, I think there's a legitimate call for reparations for uh, for the des descendants of slaves. I, I absolutely think there is. I think there's a legitimate call for reparations because of what uh, Japanese internment during uh, World War II. I think there's a legitimate call for reparations because of what Native people experienced with residential schools and and massacres and, and any number of things that that have occurred uh, in the in the uh, in the American genocide. I think there's there, there's legitimate calls for all that stuff. That's not what this is. And when I when I hear, you know, leaders from the black community saying, "Look, we've been calling for for reparations for all these years, and now all of a sudden, Native people through the Bi Biden administration got pushed to the front of the line." I mean, it's almost as if we're being told that Deb Haaland represents some sort of reparations. I got news for you. Um, Mitch McConnell <coughs> claimed that uh, uh, that 
reparations w- um, for black people came in the form of uh, Barack Obama. No, Barack Obama didn't represent black reparations any more than Deb Hallands represents uh, native reparations. So let's let's stop that. Let's stop that altogether. This isn't about reparations. I will say that it is more difficult in the United States to fund um, marginalized people individually with the exception of native people. And the only reason that, that, that we are that exception is because we weren't a part of the United States. It wasn't until 1924 that the United States tried to force citizenship upon us, but they had to recognize that they had a commitment. Again, I go back to this thing. They, they've always had this commitment. They call it a trust responsibility. <laughs> and it's the farthest thing from real trust. <laughs> it's not trust as a virtue. It's trust as if we were, you know, they were treating us as if we were like wards of the state. That's not the way we looked at it, but that's how they looked at it. So there are, there are things in place legally in the United States for them to do things specifically to target the problems in Native territory. Most of the time they don't do it. I know when they, they address issues uh, of inequality as it relates to black people, they've got to do it more broadly. So the, the, you know, fixing uh, uh, voting rights. It's clear that some of the, uh, um, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act w- was geared towards um, solving some of the inequities that, that black people experience. The Civil Rights Act, that was, it was geared towards solving some of the inequities uh, that black people experience. Now, it's not, it doesn't say black people specifically. Affirmative action, ma- much of that is geared towards fixing the in- inequalities. And, and yes, they have to open that up to more than just black people. Uh, in this stimulus package, there was also a conversation about addressing uh, the, the problem of, of black farmers losing their, uh, you know, losing their livelihoods. So there's a portion of this, uh, you know, I don't know how many billions, you know, a billion and a half or a couple of billion dollars that there are, is going towards, um, towards supporting black farmers. It is, it doesn't have to, it doesn't say specifically exclusively black farmers. It's a black farmers, but that includes other, um, uh, you know, other groups that have been socially disadvantaged. That's that, that's just the way the law works now, and I'm not saying that there, there shouldn't be targeted reparations, and and there absolutely should be. But I, anybody who resents Native people because this 31 billion dollars got thrown in there, man, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. And I've got one final argument to even put that to rest. Not only has there been inadequate funding to Native territories. But Native people have been screwed, not just out of the initial land sessions, but even on the lands that we kept, even on the lands that we were supposed to be able to utilize and generate income from. Oftentimes, you know, oil revenue, um, timber leases, grazing leases, water rights, all of that stuff. We have been screwed out of that all the time. And why? Because the Interior Department, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is the ones that manage some of that. In the late 90s, a woman by the name of Eloise Cabell initiated a class action suit against the Interior Department and the Treasury Department, alleging that as much as $150 billion, $150 billion worth of assets are completely unaccountable for. And why? Because some of them is gone. It was just lost, given away, sold out, bad investments, $150 billion. As the, the, the Justice Department hired Arthur Anderson, which was a premier accounting firm, kind of went down in flames with, uh, with the Enron scandal back in the day. But they hired Arthur Anderson to try to do some sort of forensic audits on, uh, on just what the Interior Department had done in the mismanagement of Native assets. And it's a complete mismanagement of Native assets. This is our stuff. This isn't something owed to us. This is our stuff. And Arthur Anderson... Their conclusion was that it was impossible. It was impossible to account for uh, for that loss. That the records were either you know burnt, destroyed, tossed out, shredded. I mean, the Interior Department had completely, you know, been derelict or criminal in their management of Native assets. Arthur Anderson said, "You need to come up with a settlement." And and the the conversation. You know, you know, look, the federal government always said, no, it's not anywhere near $150 billion. But during the Bush administration, the number that just kept coming around was $30 billion. I mean, that's a far cry from $150 billion. And by some estimates, it was closer to $200 billion. But 
$30 billion was being thrown away, thrown around. I mean, there was some talk that, that the Bush administration might try to settle the whole Cobell suit with, thir- with a $30 billion settlement. It didn't happen. Republicans pushed back. Even Democrats pushed back. So during the Obama administration, they did reach a settlement. $3.4 billion. So when I hear people talking about $31 billion now, and I think about $150 billion being stolen from Native territories, acknowledge that it, that there probably should have been a, a settlement in the $30 billion range, but the Obama-Biden administration settles this thing at $3.4 billion. And let me be clear, that's not $3.4 billion that came to Native people. No, only about $1.4 billion of it actually came to Native people who had had their individual monies accounts um, screwed up by the Interior Department. You know, some people got a $1,600 check to sign off on. $2 billion of that $3.4 billion, (laughs) that was targeted to buy back land that the Interior Department had somehow allowed title to transfer. So $2 billion didn't go back to Native territory. It went back to white people. So Native people could reclaim the land that the, that the Interior Department mismanaged. So I'm sorry. If, if you're euphoric over this $31 billion, or if you're jealous about this $31 billion, whatever the case may be, you need to check yourself. You need to learn what the Cobell suit was about. That's, that, those are assets, and those are resources, and those are dollars and, and land titles that we were screwed out of. In, mo- in modern times, right up until the 1990s, this is, this is going on. And, and, and frankly, still continues today. So that's the truth. And, and that was settled for, for, again, pennies on the dollar. Pennies on the dollar. Not to mention that the income generated that, that the Native people were screwed out of in the first place, much of that income was was assessed pennies on the dollars. What we were getting paid for oil revenue or timber revenue or water rights or grazing or any of these land leases, it was never fair market value. Why? Because the the amount of te- nepotism, the amount of you know uh, cronyism that the Interior Department was playing with native assets is it was is criminal. It was it was and and it's been criminal for for generations. This $31 billion doesn't even, doesn't even come close to addressing the backfill of uh, inadequate funding. But it certainly, it, it also doesn't even address the fact that, that, the, that the Obama-Biden administration screwed Native people with their Cobell settlement. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to get all excited about Joe Biden's administration doing, you know, appointing Deb Haaland or you know, sending this $31 billion. Look, I, I'm glad it's happening. But no, this this doesn't win you. Was doesn't win me over to to the to the Democrats or to the uh, to the Biden administration. We got a long way to go yet. There are native people. The Seneca Nation is being has been screwed uh, out of a billion and a half dollars because the uh, the uh, the incompetence of the Interior Department to even regulate things like uh, like native gaming and the the overly aggressive states uh, aggression from from states. So we'll see if Deb Haaland, a native secretary of the interior, steps up and, and, and fixes that problem. Because it's not just the Senate Nation. It's, you know, it's, you know, Agosasne, it's, it's Oneida, it's, it's other, you know, other states across the United States, New Mexico, uh, Oklahoma. All, you know, there's any number of states that have been screwing native people out of gaming revenue while the Interior Department sat back and did nothing. Now's the time. We'll see what happens. And look. I'm not condemning $31 billion coming to Native territories. I'm, I'm, I'm a little pissed off about the reaction to it. I'm not condemning it. I'm glad it's coming. But we're not even. We're not even close to even. We're not even close to even. So I want people to realize that. So, um, look, before I sign off, I've, we've got a great couple of shows coming up next week on, on Monday and Wednesday. We, uh, we interviewed the director for a, a documentary called The Bears on Pine Ridge. It, uh, it, it's about this group of incredible women that are uh, trying to push back and fight um, the suicide problem. It started out, as I mentioned earlier, started out in them addressing the inadequacies of, uh, of education. But immediately 
the with the the rise in the number of youth suicides, the shift from from uh, folks like uh, Tiny DeCorey and Eileen Janis began to really direct their attention towards suicide. So the film is directed by uh, Noel Bass, and um, it is called the the Bears on on Pine Ridge. We have two shows. The first show is an interview with uh, with uh, Noel Bass, and the second one, which will uh, it's again two part series, Monday and, and Wednesday. The Wednesday show will be the interview with uh, Tiny DeCorey and uh, Eileen Janis. These are two shows that you really should not miss. You should never miss any of them. I encourage you to sign up for our uh, for our podcast. You can search us on any of your favorite podcast platforms and subscribe to um, Let's Talk Native with John Kane. And uh, if you just search online Let's Talk Native with John Kane podcast, you'll find any of those platforms, and then you won't miss a show. So uh, I thank you for checking us out, and I encourage you to check out Mondays and Wednesday shows in particular. And, uh, and we'll see you then. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Now it.